there are many ways to make a spear, many more than five. I'm just, and they, the making of spears on a lathe has gone back, I'm sure several hundred years. And there's definitely, I, I know probably eight or nine ways to make a sphere now, or I've read about them. And, but I'm just gonna talk about the ones that I know how to do myself and my own journey through making better and better spheres over time. Now, Jim Schuster, again, he made a demonstration to the club about four or five years ago about making spheres. And I did not attend that, but I suspect that at least one of my methods is very similar to his. So I want Jim to be uh, quiet from the peanut gallery, I guess. <laughs> All right, so let me start. Okay, you should see a video of a sphere right now. Um, basically, um, let me start the video now. These are some of the, some finished spheres that I uh, have uh, done in the, in the recent past. These are all hollow. Um, I like to hollow the spheres frequently, but not always. And um, the more scraggly the wood is, the more defects in the wood, the better I, I think that it's, um, the sphere shape is, is, is very uh, compatible with, with ugly wood. So a burl or a, uh, a root ball, very good in making a, uh, making a sphere. Okay, and how I do it is I have this tub near my, um, near my workbench and I put various pieces in that, that are sort of still good but not big enough for other things. And I use this to, make, uh, to collect wood to make spheres. And you can see some of these are uh, already turned into cylinders and have tenons put on. Others have been partially turned into spheres and are maybe drying. Um, you know, if you make something into a sphere from green wood and then you uh, let it dry, number one, it might crack because it's still solid. And number two, it'll change shape. So um, um, anyways, I do make some, uh, I do make a, make a practice of using dry wood for most of my spheres. Now these, this table here is, is in my shop and all these spheres are what I made um, either practicing for today's demonstration or, um, or during the demonstration itself. And I want to mention that um, what I'm, I used my, uh, my son as cameraman for this. And then I uh, took the, the different, um, uh, video files and, and edited into a into a single coherent uh, semi coherent uh, uh, film, and this film will last roughly uh, two hours. So I want to mention that. So most of these spheres here are solid. Um, they range from that, which is a little bit bigger than a golf ball, to a little bit bigger than a uh, a softball. These are uh, all done on the lathe with. Uh, at least part of, part of it done with it, which I'm gonna call method number one with cup centers. And you can see that um, this is a, that was a burl piece with a bark inclusion. And again, spheres look nice, it show off the, the uh, pieces or the uh, um, defects in the wood quite nicely. This large one on the back, I did turn on the, on the video and I um, hollowed it out and I'm letting it dry. And it is, as, after it, uh, after I hollowed it out, it did lose some of its spherical shape, and I haven't decided if I'm going to put it back on the lathe and retrue it or not. Okay, so now I'm going to start um, with uh, the five methods. After each method is complete, I'm going to pause and ask for questions. You can't interrupt me or, or Joe or, or the other uh, uh, Ron Seeloff. If you have, uh, if you're aware of people who are ready to ask questions, you could interrupt me, but. I'm going to interrupt myself after at the end of each um, each method. Okay, so the first one method I'm going to talk about is between cup centers, and here I'm starting to show you I have three different size uh, wooden cups that I've made: a, a, a large, a medium, and a small. And I would say the small uh, cup center is, is those all go in the in the chuck on the drive side. Um, the small goes, I could make things as small as maybe a golf ball. The medium sized I do for like tennis ball up through a um, little bit larger than a baseball. And then the largest cup center is uh, I make, I can use up from uh, really softball size up through basketball size. Now you'll notice here, um, 
let's see how come that didn't work. All right, right here, the um, you see the wood is burned, um, and that is because if you, there, sometimes you have to press quite hard uh, between with a wood on wood uh, jam chuck, more or less a friction chuck, and if the if the chuck is not um, if if it if the, if the fit is not exactly perfect, maybe you'll see the, the sphere will start to rotate in the chuck. And I, you see I've burned a, burned a rim there. So what I do usually is I add a, a layer for friction. And you see I'm holding a piece of uh, shelf liner that I've used. Um, and uh, down here, I also have a piece of white foam from the craft store from Pat Catan's. And those work, but my favorite is leather. And I'm showing a thin piece of leather that I machined or I cut off of a pair of gloves I had. And um, that is my favorite piece, or fr anti-friction device. And it provides a little bit of cushion to prevent marring of the sphere, okay. Now this piece I'm showing now, I had some little bit extra silicon caulking that I uh, had from a job on my house and I poured some into a cup chuck to see if the, the silicon, silicone would work as a cushioning, but it's too soft. It doesn't quite work well. Um, however, you can mix cornstarch in with uh, silicone and it makes it harder. And on this one here, I did make, cut a groove into the, sh into the cup chuck and I added some of that silicone uh, with, uh, with cornstarch and it made a, a stiffer material, but I still, even when I'm using this one, I tend to use the leather uh, leather cushioning in between the sphere and the and the chuck. All right, now for the tailstock side, um, I use a Nova Live Center, and you know if you're familiar with that, there's uh, many different attachments that come with the Nova. The one I just showed a second ago was the steel cup chuck that works quite well, and I use that quite a bit. But you, there are other options. This one is a um, is a wooden, uh, a machined or a turned uh, cup chuck, and it has a, uh, a Morse taper too, um, right here uh, that fits into the Morse taper in the in the Nova Live Center and allows you to use that. Some people um, prefer not to use a cup on the tailstock side, but instead a flat uh, piece, and that works well. And I do have tried that, but I don't. I personally don't like it. This is a a, a flat. Uh, Piece. Again, um, it's a Morse taper there and it's a flat right there. And I put a piece, piece of uh, leather on that to uh, provide a little bit of cushion and friction. And finally, the Nova Life Center also has a screw uh, threaded uh, adapter that allows you to put a, a threaded piece into the Live Center. So all those are options. But, and I, but again, I tend, you'll see what I tend to use in a second here. I use the, the steel one that comes with the, with the um, with the live center, with the Nova Center. So here I'm putting a piece on the, um, on the lathe and I'm just freehanding um, the shape to get it reasonably close to the sphere. I'm not gonna make, on this first one, I'm not gonna make it that close to a sphere on purpose so that you can see how the cups, patience with the cup centers can, can actually work quite well to get you uh, pretty close to a sphere. Uh, or exactly to a sphere, um, even if the if the if you're starting with something quite uh, out of round. Um, I'm using a, a a large bowl gouge here. There's no real need to use this. I'm using it just because I had sharpened it before I started. Um, a smaller bowl gouge is actually a little bit probably uh, easier to use, um, and a spindle gouge would certainly work for for much of this work also. And in, I. Uh, I just tend to use what's, what is sharp. Um, what else do I want to say? So the idea with a cup chuck is to um, turn it on one axis and then rotate the sphere in the, or the, the partial sphere in, into the, in, in the cups to get a different orientation of the axis and then um, turn away. You'll see when, when it's not, um, when it's not round, you'll see a ghost image on the top and you sort of turn away the ghost image in order to get um, uh, more closer and closer to a sphere. So when I started making spheres, I did use this method, but I, um, okay, here I'm checking the diameter. A, a quick gauge on how to, um, 
how to decide if you're reasonably close to a sphere is to is to measure the diameter at what I'm calling it at, at zero or at the midpoint. And then you look at plus 45 degrees and minus 45 as I'm doing here. And if, if your diameter is equal at the uh, plus 45 and minus 45, you're getting pretty close to being a uh, spherical shape. And then I, uh, I did check on the, and the, on the 90 degree orientation. And this is a little bit of a squat um, piece where the, it, was, it was fatter than it was long. And that's going to be a little bit of a trouble you'll see later on. Okay, so again, back to the um, idea behind the cup center is you turn it on multiple axes. You turn it a little bit, you change the axis, you turn it a little bit more, etc. Now, when I first started doing this, um, I, I wasn't doing it that great. Um, th theoretically, you can just turn it once and you can hit it. And we saw a pro turner, Mark St. Ledger, do that. Okay, so here I'm looking at the, the other axis here and you see it's not, it's getting round, but it's not that round, but I'm gonna make, I'm gonna say that's close enough. You see the live center, um, is um, the steel cup center here. I'm inserting the, uh, the cup chuck. So again, I was mentioning Mark St. Ledger. He demonstrated to our club five or six years ago and he turned it round by eye on one axis. He flipped it once, 90 degrees, and he uh, turned it, the ghost image off almost perfectly and um, he got it round, you know, in 10, 15 minutes. It's very impressive. I was never that successful doing that. I ended up trying to make a uh, softball size and ended up with a baseball size because I had to keep on uh, turning it, rotating it in this chuck more and more often. Um, over time, I got better. But the real breakthrough for myself was when I saw Christian Burchard uh, demonstrate at the Pittsburgh Symposium. And he really... Um, emphasizes two things. One, to uh, turn on three axes. And I'm going to show that in a second here. And the other thing is to do slight nibbling at, at each axis rather than doing um, going whole hog and trying to make the piece uh, round in only one or two turns. So here's the three axes. Here's the axis of the lathe is horizontal in one direction. Um, I'm calling, I might want to call that the x-axis. The y-axis would be horizontal this way and the third axis would be vertical. So you, uh, if instead of turning randomly to get random axes, if you stick with these X, Y, and Z axes, you'll be um, you're better off. So in this case, the, so the lathe is turning, it's always turning in this direction. That's, you don't take, change that, but you will rotate the, um, the, the sphere in the, uh, in the, uh, around the, y-axis or around the z-axis here um, alternately and you get closer and closer to um, um, to a sphere over time and so that's what I'm going to do do now is I'm going to start turning this and you can see I left the, the tenon on and I'm gradually removing the tenon to get closer to the sphere. Now the te technique I use here is you'll see um, I'm going to I call it a, um, a, a pivoting cut, especially with an interrupted cut like this where I'm removing just the tenon. It's better to, to um, uh, not slide the, the tool on the, on the tool rest as I'm doing now, but you'll see later on I'll do more of a pivoting cut and I'll stop the lathe when I get there. Okay, now watch here. I'm not really going to slide. The, I'm not going to slide the uh, tool this way, but instead I'm going to pivot it at this with this point here. So uh, it's a very gentle cut, a non-aggressive cut, and it prevents catches. See how I'm pivoting the the tool uh, to get rid of that uh, tenon there. Now you see that did you you saw the. Uh, the tool did catch a little bit and it stalled. Uh, good, the fact that the leather piece was there would, is preventing that from uh, burning against the, the chuck. So every now and then I'll tighten the, the tailstock a little bit to improve that. Okay, now uh, 
you see most of the chuck is, uh, a tenon is removed, but it's still not very close to round. So I'm gonna to continue to remove material. Now this first uh, sphere I'm showing, it took me 20 minutes and roughly 20, um, 20 rotations in the, in the chuck to get it round. And that's for two reasons. One, I started with a, with a, with a bad preform. I mean, it was a very, very much out of round. Um, but number two, I was not, I was not into the groove yet. I had not made a sphere in by this method in maybe uh, a year. And it just had, I had to get back into the, um, back into the scheme of things, I guess, into the swing. So after, after I finished this video, uh, I probably had made 20 spheres in a, in a, in the span of a month. And I was able to do a similar piece here after only, um, maybe 10 minutes instead of 20. So I cut myself in half, cut my time in half. Okay, you see here that um, I think I'll be showing the how I rotate this piece. One time I'll rotate it a, that way, a vertical rotation versus a horizontal rotation. The other thing I wanna say about this method, again, um, you, if you were looking from the Turner's view, my view, you'll see a ghost image where things, uh, you'll see a, uh, uh, parts that are non-round. And that's the stuff you're removing. And you can try to remove it all very quickly in one uh, iteration here, or you can try to go very gently. And I've chosen to go very gently. I'm switching to a scraping mode sometimes, especially when you get close to the chuck, it's a little bit easier to use that. Um, if you hold the tool horizontal for a scraping motion, it's just a regular scrape. But if you hold the tool handle down, you get more of a shear scrape and that's usually a, a cleaner cut. Now, um, you notice here, let me see, wait till I turn it. Can't see it yet. All right, right here, you see it's quite flat. So what I'm saying, what I'm looking at here, if this is a cross section, if this is, this is a perfect circle, if your piece, if your uh, blank has a little protuberance on it, like it's oval in this direction, it's really quite simple just to remove this stuff here and you'll be round, okay? But if your, if your blank has a flat spot like this, um, You won't. Um, you have to remove everything everywhere in order to get a smaller sphere that would be about this size. Okay, so um, this is the case here. I have a flat spot here, so I have to remove the diameter everywhere around the whole piece in order to get it round. And that's why, especially if I'm I'm being very um, uh, risk risk averse here in, in terms of removing too much material, it's going to take a while. Again, um, I was able to do this, um, I would cut this time in half by the time I got uh, back into the groove of, of making spheres. Now I viewed using cup centers as the, uh, pretty much a fundamental way you have, uh, that I use for every, making every sphere. Even my other four methods are just a way of getting, it, uh, getting the blank uh, much more round before I, I, I remove it from the from the chuck. All right, you, you should be able to see that it's not that round yet, I'm getting closer. But again, um, and one side is, is, is more round than the other.
I'm going to jump ahead in the video a little bit now. So again, it took me um, roughly 20 minutes and 20, um, 20 changes of the uh, repositioning of the sphere in the, in the, um, in the cup chucks to get it round. This is a piece of ambrosia maple. It also has some fault spalting in it. And there's a one spot that was kind of punky and you'll see me having to spend a little bit extra time working to get rid of the tear out on this piece later on. But I'm not concerned with tear out at this position at this time because it's still so far out of round. The other thing is, again, the, the rules of grain orientation do apply. So at one, if, if the sphere is in the um, spindle orientation, you want to uh, cut this from the, the uh, large diameter to the small, in other words, cutting downhill. And when you rotate the piece around, you have to keep track of that and maybe you would uh, be cutting from small diameter to large. However, in something like this, I'm, uh, I frequently lose track of that and I don't, uh, I don't always cut in the appropriate direction and sometimes the, the cut gets a little bit um, rough, but um, it's usually not bad enough that it can't be um, remedied with some sanding or some shear scraping like I'm doing here. Hope you could see that the ball is quite round, much rounder compared to um, a few minutes ago. You can see that the surface is a little bit rough. It's a technique I, um, I've seen used by some people. You squirt the material with water, the wood with water, it stiffens the fibers a little bit and it helps with um, tear out in some cases, in many cases. So I, I tend to do that uh, on this, on some of the wood, especially if it has a little punky spot or something, the um, uh, wet wood seems to cut a little bit nicer. I use plain water and sometimes I use water with a little bit of dishwashing uh, soap in there. I use the same, uh, Especially with the dishwasher soap, it's good for um, wet sanding of, uh, of finished pieces. Also, when I put uh, varnish or poly, wipe on poly on my pieces, I might sand in between um, layers, and I use and I use wet uh, water with dishwashing soap to um, to lubricate the sandpaper when I'm sanding finishes. All right, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Okay, now it's the ball is pretty round, and I've switched to a uh, negative rake scraper to fine tune the shape. Again, I'm primarily because of the uh, the punky area was is, was too much tear out compared to what I usually have. Now this negative rake scraping. Um, I'm uh, getting more and more used uh, used to it and I like it quite a bit. This piece, this specific tool here is a D-way tool. You can see it's such a gentle technique. You don't even have to have the piece in a, uh, in a handle. And this specific um, um, scraper has two ends with different profiles and it's useful for different parts. But you just hold the tool horizontal on, this, on the tool rest and it makes a very clean cut. You see, I'll switch sides in a second. Uh, and this is a little bit narrower profile, allows me to get closer to the chuck. Um, and again, negative rake scraping re um, allows you to, it's a refining tool, it's not a bulk removal tool, but it, it, it does work quite well in terms of smoothing out the cut. And it doesn't catch it. It's, it doesn't, uh, a regular scraper has a tendency to self-feed or catch. And uh, these negative rake scrapers do not do that. So that's why you can get away with not putting it into a handle. 
negative rake scraper has to be sharpened very frequently. It requires a burr to work and the burr might only last for a minute or two. Eric Lofstrom, who is our uh, speaker and intended to speaker in August, is an expert on the negative rake scraper. And I was hoping to learn a lot more from him about how he sharpens them and how he, he does honing. Uh, he hones his, his negative rake scrapers and he, and he, um, and then he uses a, a burnishing tool to, to add the, add the, uh, add the burr. And I'd love to see, watch him do it and learn from him, but I'm not sure he's going to be able to come. Okay, so now I'm sanding. And again, with sanding, I'm probably starting at 120 grit here. Um, you do have to sand on all three axes, the X, Y, and Z axes, again, in order to get full coverage of the sanding. And now I don't want to damage uh, the surface of the sphere at all, so I added leather on both sides of the cup chuck, both, both cup ch cups of the, of the uh, uh, cup chuck system. I usually sand um, spheres, just plain hollow spheres like this to 320 or 400 grit. And I switch to wet sanding after uh, I get to 120, after 120 grit, I go to 240 and I usually do wet sanding. And I, and I uh, you've heard me talk about wet sanding quite a bit. I use walnut oil for that. And um, I just find it uh, makes a real nice finish, a nice satiny or velvety smooth finish that uh, after the walnut oil cures in a, in a week or two, I will uh, buff it with a Beal system. And it looks, and I just, that's a very nice touch uh, surface that people seem to like. There's my uh, preferred brand of uh, walnut oil, Doctor's Woodshop. He's a, He's a small business in Oregon, and I buy mostly from him. I have bought the Mahoney's oil. It works just as well. Um, nice thing about oil is, uh, the walnut oil is, uh, it's non-toxic. You can eat it. You can use it for moisturizing your hands. Um, it works quite well. There's no, no solvents in it at all. It's just pure walnut oil. Doctor's Woodshop offers quite a few other types of uh, varieties where he mixes in shellac or wax with his walnut oil. I, I have not uh, used those, um, those other types of um, finishes, but I'm real happy with walnut oil. Sometimes I'll use that as the base. I, I might uh, put wipe on poly on top of the walnut oil or even a lacquer. I spray on lacquer on top of walnut oil. If it's uh, fully cured, there's no big problem there. Walnut oil does pop the grain, just like Danish oil or any other oil, tongue oil, although it is does tend to be a little bit less amber than the other oils. How long do you let it uh, cure before you buff it? In the um, at least two weeks. Um, in the summertime, I'll put these out on my uh, patio and uh, let the sun hit it for three or four hours. And that's, that tends to accelerate the curing. In the wintertime, I'll put it in my oven at, uh, under the warm function, like 150F or something like that. And the heat from the oven for several hours does accelerate the curing. Um, both Mahoney did not say he does that. He says, if you put it on thin enough, apparently it, it, it cures quicker, according to him. Um, I find that um, it takes a while to cure. And the, the way I, I uh, test to see if it is um, cured is I put it on a sheet of paper, like a, just an eight and a half by 11 white sheet of paper. And if it leaves an oil mark on the sheet after a while, then you know that um, the oil is still, um, oil is not still soft. Okay, so before I go to method two, I'm going to add any other questions on, or any questions on, um, on using the sphere, Jake, or on using the, uh, the cup centers. Um, Mike, uh, did you 
were you wet sanding that with the oil on there at the end? Yes, with 240 grit. Yeah. Thank you. I, if, um, if I was gonna make that a finished product and try to sell it, I would go up to 400 grit. Now that, had, that piece there had a little bit of a tear out I pointed to, I, I don't know if you probably went by so quickly, but there was a small torn out area that was not responding. And I would probably work a little bit harder to get rid of that through wet sanding. Wet sanding does tend to fill in the tear out with, with a sanding slurry that when it cures, it's pretty good. Or maybe I might even have to add some CA glue to that area to, uh, to make it smooth. Later on, I'm, gonna, I, I'm making, I show a larger uh, sphere out of white ash. And that one had a, a, a punky spot also that I just, the, the tear out was quite, uh, in this one area was quite severe. I ended up filling that with, uh, the, uh, with metal powder, uh, pewter powder, bright silver, and uh, with CA glue, and it turned out quite nifty. Um, but again, you could, uh, if you put the, the walnut oil down first, you have to let that cure before you, um, before you start adding CA glue on top of it. Mike, have you used Odie's oil at all? No, I've heard of it. I don't like to buy things where they keep the ingredients secret. And that's when you don't know what's in it. So I haven't decided to, uh, about that. It looks okay. Some people like it. I've read about uh, good reviews on it, but I don't know what's in it. So I haven't used it. <laughs> it's, it's not that cheap either. All right, here's this, my method number two is a sphere jig. Now you could buy commercial jigs. They're roughly three or $400, even $500. Um, I've been very happy with these homemade jigs. This first one I'm showing you is a, made out of wood and this uh, fit my, uh, my older jet lathe. I, you can see that uh, lathe is not uh, in my shop anymore. I, I, got, I uh, now have uh, a stubby, which I purchased from uh, Jim Pugh when he started uh, having health issues. But here's some essential features of, of a homemade lathe or homemade uh, sphere jig. First of all, this angle here is not 90 degrees. It was customized for the jet uh, to fit on the jet bed, bedways. Okay. Second thing is this piece here uh, is clamped onto the bedways, and this it's got a block underneath that is exactly fits tightly in, in between the bedways, and uh, that keeps the, uh, the pivoting of this jig exactly on center. Now here, I'm not using a, uh, any type of special bearing. It's just a nuts and bolts in a, in a, with washers to fit tightly in, into a hole uh, drilled into the wood. And I put like a pipe on the inside of that. So, the, so there's a steel pipe embedded into the wood and uh, this nut and bolt goes through there to, to make a, a relatively tight uh, pivot. This is one of my hollowing tools. It's a square shaft with a carbide tip. It's held down with a screw uh, piece, uh, a screw, uh, just a, a, a thumb screw, really. And you loosen the thumb screw and advance this, the, the, the cutting tool into the piece as, as you get closer and closer to a sphere. Now this piece, again, the, a commercial piece would be very hefty steel that would not vibrate, but my piece does uh, this made out of wood that vibrates too much, so I had to add a secondary rest. This is the, the, the primary tool holder, but this is a secondary tool rest right here, and it has a threaded nut in there that allows you to um, uh, raise it and lower it to get this perfectly on center. If the tool is not cutting on center, it won't produce a round, a round, uh, it won't produce a, a round sphere. It'll produce something with like a nipple on the end. See there the side view, and you see that um, it's going to be rotating around to make the sphere on the pivot point. Okay, so I learned I could make a sphere in five ten minutes using that on the jet lathe, um, with on the new lathe that has a different swing and different bed. So I made a uh, a newer uh, sphere jig that I thought would be better. I couldn't do this one myself. I had to help have help, and some of this was made with the help of Tom Olichu. He helped me make this um, I, uh, this wooden, or this instead of wood, I use what's called phenolic. It's like a re resin impregnated uh, canvas 
that uh, or Kansas canvas that's re impregnated with resin that's very um, stiff and perfectly planar and, and it has a good polish on it. And Tom also found these turnbuckles. It was aluminum piece of uh, piece of aluminum here that fit very tightly into this the steel cylinder and, and we use that for the pivot. Um, and then these pieces down here uh, were machined by Pete Way. So it allows me to raise and lower the, uh, lower the tool to get it um, perfectly uh, aligned. Here I'm clamping the, the, uh, the piece to the, to the bed ways to get it as tight as possible. You see later on, I'm not only uh, tight uh, clamping it there, but I also tightened it here because it was a little bit loose. And you see again, I have a it, it's a um, the the cutting tool here is a um, is one of my hollowing tools. It slides in it slides in and out uh, through this hole here, and it's held down with a thumb screw. And this this bit is a uh, stainless steel bit, um, just a quarter inch square or a 3 16 inch square bit. So I wanted the capability to uh, change from a, from a quarter inch to a 3 16 inch bit in this tool. So I needed to have this more adjustable. And also I wanted to put a, a carbide in here. And each one of the, each one of the uh, different cutting bits requires a slightly different tool height. Okay, you see it's sliding on the thing, on the uh, pivot. This allows me to make a uh, sphere roughly eight or nine inches in diameter. And my swing of the lathe is bigger than that, but this thing, th this uh, pivot, and the uh, and the way we we design the with this turnbuckle here, it consumes about one or two inches of uh, height, and it limits how big of a sphere I can make because this has to be directly under on the diam equator of the sphere. All right, so here's a very large piece of burl. This is a uh, honey locust burl. I've, I've been collecting wood since, I don't know, probably 10 years, 2011. I've never, I've seen honey locust many times, but I've never seen a honey locust burl before. So this is kind of a nifty um, uh, experience for me. See, I was partially turned round, but it, it looks more, much more like a pear than it does a, a sphere. I left the bark on the one side. This one I definitely intend to um, hollow. Something that's eight or nine inches in diameter won't uh, won't dry very effectively unless it's hollow. Okay, it's starting to cut. That means the the um, the area near the middle of the sphere is is, is um, small lower smaller diameter than near the end. So I have to. Um, um, work on the end of this first to get it round. You want to be very gentle with this again also, not surprising. And if you don't, the secondary rest is required. If not, uh, because just because this piece is not as stiff as the commercial yeah. brands. And so you really need the two tool rests to make this work or else uh, I found uh, it, it, you can get some very severe check, uh, uh, checking or uh, catching. Mm -hmm. Turning the speed up a little bit. So what I tend to do with these, uh, with the sphere jig, is you can get it perfectly spherical over the maybe 80 to 90 percent of the uh, of the sphere. I'm going to still leave it on the chuck uh, with the tenon because. I'm going to be hollowing it. I need a way to attach the piece to uh, for hollowing. Now here I'm checking to see, and I notice that the uh, the platform is not quite stable enough. So I'm going to add a second um, a second uh, C clamp to hold it in place. And you see that right here. It's been added for more stability. That that should work to remove some of these grooves here. So what I was saying is I leave the, the piece um, 
with a tenon so that I can, I can do the hollowing. It's conceivable that you could do the complete sphere with a, with a jig and then um, jam it into a jam chuck and do the hollowing. But I, um, I'm never, I don't have enough confidence in the jam chuck to do that. My own jam chucks might not be that good enough to do such a thing. Moving it in maybe a 32nd of an inch uh, just by, uh, by hand moving the piece in. Again, a commercial jig would have a very nice uh, threaded tool advancement that allows you to very precisely decide how much uh, to move on each pass. If, you take, if you're too aggressive on the cut, like that was relatively an, an aggressive cut, the, the uh, quality of the cut is not as good. I've just discussed with, with the, um, with a, a scraping type uh, tool um, presented flat to the tool, uh, flat to the piece like this, it's, a, it's not the cleanest cut for sure. And I've experimented but with a hunter carbide cu uh, cutter in uh, it's at a 30 degree angle, very similar to what Jameson was using uh, two months ago. The cut is much, much cleaner, very much uh, a, a nice shearing cut that and I, I do stick that into this um, sphere jig on occasion. Although I find I, if once I get it round like this, I could just switch to conventional tools and, and clean, up the, clean up the tear out um, afterwards. And it just takes a couple of minutes. So I tend to do that rather than, um, rather than changing the tool bit in this jig all the time. The other problem I have with this piece is the orange wood at the, uh, at the on the on the t headstock side is uh, heartwood, and the white co cream-colored wood on the on the other side of the on the tailstock side is is sapwood, and they're in, in honey locust the uh, the sapwood is much much softer and much more prone to tear out. We could see. Um, only been doing this for a few minutes and it's already quite round. Is the piece hollowed already? No, there's, there's just a hole drilled down the middle. What I'll do is I'll, I'll hollow it to roughly a, a relatively thick wall thickness, maybe about a half of an inch. Then I'll let it dry and I'll look at it and if it's out of round, I'll, I'll uh, stick it back on using cup centers and get it round again. If it's just a little bit out or it looks pleasing to me, you can see it's quite round here. It's almost, it is a, it's a perfect sphere all the way from, uh, from here to here. So that's about 80% of the, of the sphere is round. You can see the cut is, rel is quite rough and I could play with that. And again, using a, a, a carbide, a, a hunter carbide um, would get that much cleaner but um, I'm gonna use, just use my scrapers to get it to clean up the surface now. This is a standard uh, scraper. It's not a negative rake scraper. And you'll see later on, about in a minute or two, you'll see a catch. And that's because of a little bit careless. I got too far off the, the tool rest and um, just, it's not as forgiving as it. I, I'm still better with a regular scraper than I am a negative rake scraper, but um, and it, I, I can, uh, there, there it was there. That was a, I put a divot in the thing that I had to work a little bit harder to get rid of. That would not have happened with a negative rake scraper. And you can see the surface is extremely cleaned up compared to the right half. Now I'm turning the scraper. Sometimes I use the scraper flat on the tool rest, relatively flat. The handle is still higher than the cut. So your tool rest is higher than center and you're, and you're holding the tool slightly uh, up, up or you know, to get a uh, handle slightly higher than horizontal. And, and that type of cut is, uh, is pretty good, but it's still not gonna be the best cut. With a good burr, you frequently get a nice surface with it. 
but later on I'm going to turn the rotate the tool up on its edge so it's it's uh, presented at 45 degrees to flat and that is uh, it's much more like a shear scrape and that does improve the cut a little bit so I'm going to get to a point here where I'm going to uh, stop the video because the uh, I'm just fighting this tear out in the in the sapwood and off camera I'll, I'll uh, get rid of all that tear out uh, through a combination of finer and finer cuts with the with the various scrapers and um, then I'm going to do some wet sanding so you see the um, there is some tear out there much worse in the um, in the sapwood and I'm going to work on that off camera then I'm going to hollow it then I'm going to let it sit there and then I'll show you the finished piece later I will try my trick of, of wetting this with water uh, that does help to clean up the tear out, especially that I found that that the tear out, I got rid of all the tear out with the um, on the on the heartwood with the water squirting method, but I still had trouble with the saftwood because it was so much softer and I had to really attack that with sanding to get rid of the final pieces. So you see in the background there, that's the piece that I was just turning. Um, I hollowed it out and it's sitting and it has gone out of round, but I decided it hasn't got, got out of round enough that I'm going to put it back on the lathe. It looks fine the way it is. And on the tenon, I'll carve, I'm, I'm experimenting now, instead of just removing the tenon and making a flat on the bottom of the sphere for the piece to sit, I'm putting little legs on it or little feet. And I kind of like that technique. So I'm, I'm doing more and more of that. This is also wet sanded now with walnut oil. So you see the, the finish looks pretty good. All right, this is another example now where um, I'm this piece here is ash. It's uh, also turned on a jig and you can see it's round all the, the uh, pretty much everywhere except for the tenon. And I'm gonna stick this in the cup chucks to get rid of the tenon. And you can find, because this is so round, the cup chucks works so much better. And I'm able to get it um, fully round, a fully round sphere in only two or three rotations. Uh, of the axis. So I'm putting it in there. Forgot to put the leather on, so I'm going to get the leather. Because it's all so much, it's already fully uh, round, I'm going to put leather on both, of, both sides right away. This leather uh, doesn't last forever. It gets soaked with walnut oil and gets stiff after a while as, as the walnut oil cures. I got to replace it. I have one of my wife's leather purses that she doesn't use anymore and I'm cutting that up into pieces to replace these. These are leather gloves, the cuffs from leather gloves um, work very good for me. Now you'll see this is a smaller bowl gouge and you can see the pivoting cut as I start. Pivoting on the tool rest to get rid of that, uh, most of that work. There's a very gentle cut that doesn't, uh, tends not to catch pivoting in both directions. You can cut the, uh, cut the tenon off with, um, with a parting tool or a saw. And I've done that a couple of times and I burned, I burned myself by doing that because I cut it too close to the sphere and I ended up having a flat spot on the sphere. So I just find it easier to um, just uh, turn, the, uh, turn the tenon off this way. So again, I, in contrast, the first, with the very out of round turning blank that I used in the first cut in the first sphere, uh, it took me 20 rotations in the, um, in, this, in the cup centers to get it round. In this one, it only takes me three uh, to get rid of the tenon and to make it, per, and to get that 20% that's not round, round. It takes me a little bit longer uh, than three rotations because I'm trying to get rid of some uh, tear out and again, I got to work on that. I, I, um, I'm concentrating on getting the sphere and I'm not concentrating on grain, grain orientation as much as I should. And again, I lose track of the grain orientation after a while. Um, because I've rotated it so many times. But I'm switching between bevel grubbing cuts and scraping cuts 
and that also doesn't help on the surface. So you see the tenons pretty much removed, little pieces that's not yet removed. You can see my, if, if I had a camera that was uh, attached to my forehead, you would be able to see the, uh, the ghost image that was quite prominent when the tenon was spinning around there. But now it's, the ghost image is pretty much gone. And you're doing this more by feel. You feel slight little bumps of interrupted cuts as you get smoother and smoother. Okay, again, if you were really good with the, uh, a, uh, this method, you could get it perfectly round in just one iteration. I'm trying to remember which way to rotate it. Okay. That's pretty much round now. There's a few little places I think I've got to clean up with the third, with the second rotation now. A little bit of a bump there. Right by my hand, you'll notice right here, there's, there's a ring on the wood. That's because the leather had some walnut oil soaked into it from the previous sphere and, it, and the walnut oil soaked into the uh, into the sphere. So that's not really a problem. I'm going to use walnut oil on the rest of the sphere anyways. You see the mark there from the walnut oil. You can see on the, on the uh, I've already gone to shear scraping as the method of cleaning up the little bits of marks. And that's because it's already, it's pretty much round already. So the advantage of the sphere jig to make this round is that uh, final touch-ups are much, much quicker. And that's really true for the other methods I'm gonna show next also. Now I'm worried about tear out and the rest of this video on this method, it's, um, directed at removing the tear out. It, the, the sphere is already perfectly round, but this tear out right there is uh, troublesome. And I, and I end up uh, giving up and filling that in with, uh, with pewter inlay, pewter powder. Okay, I'm switching to uh, negative rake scraper again. Now I have two or three different negative rake scrapers and um, I'm experimenting with different, um, different angles for the top and the bottom uh, bevels. The one that really I like the best is I turned an old skew into a, um, into a negative rake scraper. And that it's got the same uh, roughly 40 or 35 degree angle on both the top and bottom of the skew, and it works quite well as a negative rake scraper. That's probably my favorite one. This one from D-Way Tools, when I first got it, um, it worked quite well, but once I tried to resharpen it, it wasn't quite as good, and I'm still t trying to touch up these, um, the way I sharpen the, the negative rake scrapers. Now, if you see this go out of focus here a little bit, um, that's not a problem of, of, uh, of your machine. It's my camera was start, starting to act up with um, the autofocus. I didn't really realize it, it was too late. But um, anyways, um, here this is a normal scraper. scraper. This is not a negative rake. But I was tr experimenting with it to see if I could get rid of the tear out. And it works pretty good. Actually, you know, the... Um, a, a, a regular a scraper does, I find, cleans up tear out quite well. But this piece here was just um, too tough for me. I'm gonna try the water technique, the water spraying technique.
I've attempted to glue the leather onto my cup chucks. Tends not to work because of the, I tend up soaking them with oil and the oil interferes with the glue. I think hot glue might work for a while. Even hot glue might be the, might be better than leather in some respects as a, as a, uh, as a cushioning uh, or, and a friction, as a friction fit or a friction jam chuck or, uh, layer on top of the wood. You can see I'm removing the wetted wood, which was darker. It's pretty smooth now, except for one area that was giving me a hell of a problem here. All right, that's pretty round. And you see the one punky piece of wood was just too, you can actually see it was a different color than the rest of the ash. All right, so any questions on the, uh, on the method two, which was the sphere jig? No. Okay, I'm going on. Now I'm gonna talk about templates, using a template to get it round. Uh, and I'm, showing, I'm gonna show three different types of templates. Mike, I have a question. Sure. Uh, when you set up to use that sphere, uh, when you started out with that ball, it just looked like you put that on there and started. But in reality, don't you have to put your jig into the center of the size of the sphere that you're going to make? Yes, you line it up visually. First of all, you turn it roughly round by eye to get it reasonably close. So you saw when I put it on the on the um, chuck or on the spindle, it was it was pretty much, it was r roughly round. It was egg shaped, I guess, or pear shaped. Um, then you decide you uh, you line it up uh, with the the, the pivoting uh, mechanism. That's uh, it. Act, you, that has to be on the equator of the piece that you're going to make, and that's true whether you buy a commercial jig or my or the homemade jigs. Yeah, on, on yeah, I understand on the equator, but that's that's built into your jig. When you set it on your when you set it on your ways, you're in the center of the uh, of the chuck. But the distance yes. from from your uh, headstock to the pivot point isn't that a function of the size of a sphere that you're making? Yes, yes, it has to be on the equator. Mm -hmm. Right, and so. You just you happen to know what that sphere was going to be when when you put that on there, but you would have had to you would have had to adjust that. Yeah, fiddle with it. You have to fiddle okay. with it a little bit. Okay. And you know, if you were going to make, uh, I'm not sure how to. If you wanted to make an exact size sphere and make two in a row that were exactly the same size, you'd have to figure out some way to be more accurate on that. I just eyeball that usually. But if you're okay. going to again, uh, maybe you could put like a little bit of a point sticking up off of the pivoting mechanism so that you can line it up exactly where you want it on the sphere. But I just use it by eye. And even if I take it off and put it back on, I could usually get it pretty damn close, but not perfect. Okay, thank you. All right, so here is a uh, piece that I've, uh, a cylinder that I've um, turned round and I measured the diameter and I marked the uh, uh, the length to match the diameter. So again, a sphere has the length equal to the diameter. And then I marked the midpoint. And I did that with the calipers. Then I, I took that caliper measurement. I went over to a piece of construction paper 
and I and a compass and I drew a circle of that diameter and I cut it in half and I cut the template out of cardboard. And that's what I'm going to use as the first template is the simplest one. Now with this method, this template is only good for this diameter. It's something like, I don't know, um, 60 millimeters, let's say. Um, so you, you have to leave that center line on there or else the template becomes um, inaccurate. Okay, so here, this is a spindle orientation and I'm using a spindle gouge and I'm cutting downhill. You'll see later on that the, the, uh, the quality of this cut is quite good because I'm doing it right. Um, but eventually the goal here again is to make just the majority of this piece round and then finish up by taking it onto the cup center. And this method, if you do it right, you'll get reasonably close and you'll be able to uh, use the cup centers just for five to 10 minutes to, uh, to get it perfectly round by removing the, uh, removing the tenon. Now, another way to make your life a little bit easier is to turn these between centers. You don't really have to put it into a chuck. I'm just used to it and I like to use it because the cup centers require a, uh, a tenon anyways, but um, you could have the, uh, if you did it between centers, you could, you could make the piece much closer, much small, the end pieces much smaller and that's, and therefore much less material to remove when you switch the cup centers. So that was removing waste wood. Back to the spindle gouge. I never really learned spindle gouges, proper use of spindle gouges for the longest time. I took the uh, hands-on training from Keith Gottschall early um, or in the middle of last year and I found he helped me quite a bit on how to, how to use a spindle gouge properly. And every now and then I forget how to do it and I get a catch, but more often than not now I do it right. So, um, and I guess the, um, how I judge if I do it right or not is the quality of the cut, if the cut is quite smooth. I still have trouble with the spindle gouge or bevel rubbing cuts in general in terms of getting the exact contour I want. I need to resort to scraping if, to f refine the shape of something like, the, like, um, like this sphere. You see the flute is all the way over at the three o'clock position, fully closed. So by this time in my journey, I've probably made, um, in the making of this tape, um, I've probably made like six or seven spheres. And already my eye has been calibrated much better than I was um, at the beginning. And so I could eyeball in a better shape even without a template, but the template uh, is still required to get it exactly right. You see that the end where the hole is, the hole from the uh, drive center was still there. Um, I'm probably going to leave that there if I remember correctly. Um, and I'm not going to uh, worry about because later on I'm going to uh, turn rotate it in the cup center to get rid of the tenon. Again, so when I use this template, I check it zero, plus 45, minus 45, and, and 90 degrees. So you can see it's still a little bit longer than it needs to be. So I have to work on, on the ends a little bit more before I stop. 
but these cuts are pretty gentle, not removing very much material at one time. Resorting to a little bit of scraping there. Hey, getting pretty close using the template. So at some point I'll stop and um, check that you can see it's still a little bit on the plus 45 there. It was a little bit uh, not round, but good enough to switch to the other, um, to the cup chucks at that point. So now I'm making another cylinder to show the second type of template. Here I'm using a skew chisel. Here's another thing that I haven't uh, mastered, another tool. But again, after one of our demonstrators, uh, Jim Exter from a, a few, several months ago, uh, demonstrated the skew. I, I'm looking for opportunities to um, practice on the skew. Here I'm just trying to get a nice smooth cylinder, an even, even diameter cylinder using the skew. Now, this second template, I've shown this before when I made the offset baseball bat, but basically um, it doesn't require you to use any type of um, compass to, 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 measure a, to measure on construction paper and, and, and cut out and, and require you to be reasonably accurate in how to, how to uh, how to measure and cut the template. But again, the second template is similar to the first one. You'll end up with a template that looks almost exactly the same. Um, Very nice smooth cut you can get with a skew, nice smooth wood surface. This is sycamore. Sycamore is a nice wood, I like it. Um, very forgiving uh, material. It's not too hard, not too soft. So I always like to measure the, um, the diameter and mark out the midpoint. So that's the ends, and then I take the diameter in, or in half. And again, using millimeters, it's much easier to do the math. So that's the midpoint. And that's the two ends. So now I'm going to take a piece of plastic. It's a sign that I bought at Walmart. You find there's quite a few different signs. This one says uh, no trespassing or more or less. And it's made out of plastic. It's, a, it's only a, a few thousandths of an inch thick. It's thicker than cardboard or uh, construction paper, but it's not very thick. And I'm using that and I'm going to use friction on the wood to make the template. And you just press it into the wood and the friction melts the plastic. And you can get an exact uh, template using this method here. This technique I learned from a pro turner named Mark Safiri. He does a lot of uh, very interesting things. I saw him at, at the Atlanta Symposium. I wish we can, and we've been trying to get him to uh, come to Cleveland and demonstrate at our place. And someday I, I think we'll make that happen. So if you were in my shop, you'd be smelling burnt pr plastic right now.
So I wasn't quite happy with this template. It was a little bit off, uh, off center. You see the, the one side was thicker, the one tab at the, on the front of the lathe was a little bit thicker than the one on the side. So I, I ended up going and I, I used the scissors and I cut off about a quarter of an inch and I redo it, trying to center it. It just helps a little bit. It would have worked the way it was off center, but allows you to squeeze into some of the, um, some of the wood, uh, uh, some parts of the sphere a little bit nicer if it's symmetrical. So I'm pushing more with my left hand to get it, to get both sides about the same. All right, so now the same idea, using downhill cutting with a spindle gouge, I'm, tr I'm gonna um, fine tune the shape using that, using that template. You see, in all these cases, I'm making sure I don't cut on the center line, leaving that pencil mark there to mark the equator. Just removing waste wood, but not enough to make the piece um, too wobbly. Probably a one inch diameter, maybe a little bit less. This is probably a two inch sphere. So you can see it's still much longer than it is fat. A lot more uh, material to be removed off of both ends. I still check it periodically, even when I know it's not quite round, just to double check where I need to cut the most material off. Sometimes it's on the shoulder, sometimes it's on the ends. The plastic is thick enough that um, it, it's like a right, it's the correct combination of, of being flexible and stiff enough that you can stick it on a moving piece and it won't damage the, the template without turning the lathe off, yet it, uh, it won't damage the wood or the, or the template. So getting close at the for the middle uh, forty five uh, middle fifty percent of the of the sphere is pretty much round. Just have to work more on the ends. You see the surface cut is it's much better than it was on those other 
that uh, earlier pieces. When you put it in the cup chuck again, you, you, you're in danger of losing that surface because uh, unless you keep track of the grain orientation much more rigorously than I do. Oh, you see the sphere is approaching the, uh, the template quite nicely. And I think I'm going to be happy with this pretty much. All these within um, this one, the, the diameter of the uh, of how it's attached to the the, the tenon um, is so small. I will probably part this off, still being uh, making sure I'm not cutting into the the sphere, and um, um, go to the cup chucks and and probably be able to achieve uh, perfectly round uh, in maybe two or three rotations of, of the cups in the in the cups. All right, here's another piece of wood. This is going to be the third template. This one is more like a gauge than a template. And um, it's probably the most useful because you could it can work for um, multiple diameters. It's not just it's restricted to a single diameter. So again, I'm, I'm practicing with my skew trying to get uh, a nice surface finish. This is a piece of uh, spalted maple. Um, there is a a, um, a knot in that wood and caused a, a big chunk to come out. I think I go back and I use a, uh, a bedan to get rid of that just to, um, it's extra wood and I don't want it to bother me later on. Bedan is a nice tool. Strongly recommend you get one. It really cuts nice. It's like a big parting tool in many respects, but it's different. It cuts nicer. That's what I'm using here, just to get rid of waste wood. This piece of um, spalted maple came from the Metro Parks. There's a, um, a location under the Brook Park Bridge where Rocky, or the Valley Parkway goes underneath the Brook Park Bridge in uh, Rocky River the Rocky River Reservation. And uh, they have a huge area where they dump trees the, the, that have been, that the, the, the Metro Parks has cleared a tree away. Maybe it fell from a storm or whatever. And they bring it to this place and they dump it. And they cut it up into somewhat bite-sized pieces, but they give it away. And most people take it for firewood. But every now and then when I drive by, I don't go to Rocky River that often, but uh, when I do go, I always check it out. And sometimes it has some real nice piece of wood. And this, the spalting on this piece was excellent. Trouble is you're not allowed to use a chainsaw in the parks. You can pick up the wood in these places, but you can't use a chainsaw. So uh, you have to be able to carry some relatively large pieces back to your own house, your own driveway, and then do the, uh, do the uh, cutting into blanks can't do it in, 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 uh, in the parks. So again, here I'm uh, measured the diameter and transferring that to the length because again, I want the length to be equal to the diameter and then I do the find the midpoint. Luckily I can divide by two without using a calculator. So 
So this next cup or this next gauge I'm going to show in a minute, it's made out of PVC pipe, polyvinyl chloride, the white plumbing type pipe that you find at Home Depot. I have two or three different diameters of this, of the pipe, two inches, three inches, and you make small rings. And I turn them on the, um, in the, in the lathe to get them perfectly flat. And I even put a little taper on the end because I think it's a little bit easier to see the light shining through it. Show that in, in a second here. Getting rid of some of that excess wood on the, uh, on the sides. It looks like it's wobbling, but it's not. It's just the end of the piece that I didn't fully round yet is, is, is making it look that look that way. But really the piece is flat, true, smooth surfaced, and I'm just getting rid of some of that extra wood. You'll see I'll do the same on the other side and it'll look it'll become smooth right away. So the idea behind a ring a gauge is that when you have a flat ring and you put it on a circle, on a sphere, if it's perfectly round, there'll be no gap between the ring and the, and the wood. If it's an egg shape or any other non-round, you'll see light shining through between the, where the ring contacts, the, uh, doesn't quite contact the wood accurately or uh, perfectly. This is probably, I use this, I didn't use this for a long time, didn't, uh, but I started using it now and I really enjoy it. I, it's my go-to um, gauge now, as opposed to these templates that you see. Sometimes you still need the other type of template. This is the gauge I use the most, Mike. Who's, who's speaking there, is that Jim? Yeah. Okay. Sometimes the gauge doesn't fit um, in a tight corner. Like when I'm making my emerging bowls or uh, when I get very close to the tenon, the gauge doesn't work as quite as well, but it works pretty damn good. And you really, you want to emphasize it near the, um, near the equator and plus or, you know, uh, within 25% of the equator on either side. If you, if you get that round, you're, you're pretty much, that middle part, you're pretty much home free. You can, the rest of it becomes uh, quite easy. Okay, so all this so far is just by hand. You can see I'm getting better at, at turning these by with using uh, just my eye. And that's just because of practice. Again, turning is a lot like uh, in, uh, playing a musical instrument. You, you can't expect to play uh, Beethoven's Ninth Sympathy, Sympathy right away. You have to practice at it. Same thing with wood turning. And you have to refresh your skills frequently. So here, um, is my gauge, my ring gauge, I call it. You see it has a bevel near the end. And if, you, if wherever you see light is where you need, uh, it's, it's not round. So in, the, in this case, there was a, some gap. The light was, um, the light was right about here. If the ring gauge was from here to here, the light was here and it was touching, the gauge was touching the sphere at both places. So these places were high and uh, this was high and this was high and this was low. 
So you cut on both sides uh, to get the high spots off to create it, to make it round. By the way, this spindle gouge I'm using, I also bought from Jim Pugh. That was a homemade handle. I'm, I'm guessing that um, either Jim made it or maybe Tom Wisniewski made it. It's a Thompson tool, works quite well, holds its edge quite well. So you can check this all, all, all around. Again, all these methods also work with the piece between centers. Of course, here I can uh, use the, get it, uh, the tail sock end perfectly round all the way to the tip, all the way to the pole. All right, you can see that's pretty round, getting close. But um, let, me, let me go back there a little bit. I can't get it. Um, I just wanted to point out one thing. Didn't press pause quick enough there. All right, right here, you can see that there's a gap here. And that means that this is this area here is too high. And uh, um, you have to work on that to get it perfectly round. And you could obviously see that the tip is still, uh, still not round yet. But I prefer to get rid of that using the cup center. OK, so any questions on that? All right, I'm going to go to the next method. Yes. Mike, uh, what have you found as you change the size of the sphere? How should you err? Should you go smaller or larger with your gauge diameter? Um, each gauge of those of the of the cups or the uh, the rings covers a, a, a wide range. Obviously, the the gauge can't work if the sphere is smaller than the. Yeah. Right. But if it's too small, um, it still works, but no, it's not quite as easy. So I find that um, like a, that was a, like a two and a half inch pipe. Probably uh, it probably works up to like six six inch spheres. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right.
Method number four uses a hole saw. Now a hole saw, if you look on, if, if you take a hole saw and you cut off the, ring, uh, the teeth, you have something that looks a lot like, um, looks a lot like a ring gauge and you, it can work as a ring. So here's, again, I'm using the ring gauge uh, to show you again how I, would use, how I would use a ring gauge on this piece. But the same exact thing can happen with a hole saw. Here's an example. I have two different hole saws uh, bolted onto a wooden handle. And the, the advantage of the hole saw is um, it's not only a gauge, it's a cutter, it's a scraper simultaneously as, as it's gauging, it's also scraping. So you could do both at once. This piece of wood here is a uh, piece of honey locust. It's, it's quite hard wood. Locust is one of the hardest woods just as hard as hickory, for example, and um, I'm going to be able to scrape with this piece. I'm going to hold it there. You can measure uh, its freehand, freehanded to a partial sphere, and the burr is on the inside, and that's the burr that's cutting. And the this the steel of the hole saw is not anything special. It's probably just uh, low carbon steel, so it doesn't hold an edge very long. But um, you could rotate it in your hand to um, to get a fresh cutting surface before you have to take it back to the sharpener. So basically there's a burr on the inside of these. I remove the tool rests. You don't want to get a catch with it. It is possible to get a catch. So you can see the dust uh, re being removed from the, uh, from the wood. That's, the, that's this whole saw cutting. So it's measuring and cutting at the same time. Mike, what do you grind the teeth off of those? Yes, I do. And I grind them, I grind them off on a, band, on a disc grinder. Uh -huh. And you got to keep it flat. You got to, you know, you don't want to lose the, uh, you don't want to make it canted, I guess. You know, you want to keep it perfect, square, square and flat. Okay. But how I'll, do show you, work? I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. Mike, I've done the same thing with taking an old pipe and making one of those out of an old piece of pipe. Yes, you can use a pipe. I have not had good luck with pipes because a lot of pipes have seams in them. And on the inside, they're not really that round. Yeah, so you you got to find an old pipe. <laughs> yeah, and some of them, I had one pipe that worked well for a while, but I, it, um, it, I squished it and it became oval. And then yeah, I, they, ch they yeah. changed the way they make pipes, but the old, old pipes, like the old cast pipes and stuff, mm -hmm. seem to hold around and do okay. There's also something called an arch punch, A-R-C-H. And those might cost, uh, the, the steel on an arch punch, it makes, it's made and it's designed to make, uh, punch through like uh, rubber gaskets and uh, other things. You see how quickly I got this to a round. Here's how I'm sharpening it, sharpening it. But before I get there, an arch punch is made to punch holes in, in rubber gaskets or in leather. Um, it's much better steel. And I think it would last longer, but I, these work fine, I don't, and um, I haven't felt the need to buy the arch punches. To get a big one, arch punches tend to be only half inch, one inch diameter. To get one that was two inch diameter, they're not cheap. 50 bucks maybe, even 100, yeah. All right, so here I'm, uh, here's my CBN wheel. Um, I'm, not, I'm not using the tool rest, I'm gonna hold it freehand on the, the, the hole saw on the, uh, on the tools, on the, on the wheel, and the top and the bottom are gonna be on simultaneously, so it's sort of flat. And I'm gonna hold it on there very lightly, you're not taking a lot of material off, and I'm gonna rotate it in my hand. Uh, question, Mike? Yes. I, I've been told that uh, only high-speed steel should be used on the CBN wheel that you can ruin the wheel if uh, you use a, a milder steel. Have you seen any problems with your CBN wheel as a result of using it this way? No, what I believe happens, what I've been, what my research has shown is that the mild steel will clog the CBN. It'll clog up. And just like if you put aluminum on a regular grinding wheel, it clogs up all the, the little the abrasive grains that cause the cutting. So. I only do this every now and then, and then, and most of the time I'm using high-speed steel. So I believe the high-speed steel 
that I'm normally using cleans off any, uh, any of the lo lo low carbon steel that's left on the wheels. So I actually have one scraper that is not high speed steel. And I, I also use that on these wheels, but I, again, I, I um, because it's so rare that I have to sharpen the, uh, sharpen the low carbon as, as a, as a, as opposed to the high carbon steel or the high speed steel that I believe the, the, the better steel is always cleaning off my wheels. So that's it. It took me 10 seconds to cut that. All right. Any questions more on the whole saw method? I find that that works quite, uh, quite nicely. You can, uh, depending on the orientation of the wood, you can get a catch sometimes. And if the, if a grain, is or a, uh, a defect in the wood like a like a little bit of a, a crack or something hits that thing it'll it'll grab that uh, pulse on fling it out of your hands I've had that happen so you can't press too hard you can't press too lightly but in general I find them uh, they're, they're a nice addition to your to your um, repertoire Mike how round yeah. you have Mike three. yes yeah Mike. Mike, this is Jim. I've actually uh, experimented with putting a hole saw on a drill and turning it at the same time, talking about something scary. Yeah, with the teeth. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah, that would be exciting. I've seen a guy do yeah. that. Um, he, he, uh, I've seen one guy, if he turned it a perfect cylinder and he matched the diameter of the cylinder to the diameter of the hole saw, and you mount the drill in a in a wooden frame so that it just moves perfectly uh, perpendicular to the lathe bed, and you can you you like uh, push it into the piece. You'll get a perfect sphere right away. You cut a cylinder exactly. Yeah, you yes, I've seen that. And again, if you mount the drill, if you carefully mount the drill, it's probably pretty safe. And but you yeah. have to you can only make All one right. size sphere. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. Okay, I'll let you go. All right, um, so this is called the octagon method. Um, let's get rid of that, all right. So if you look at an octagon that is uh, the same diameter as the circle, um, you'll see that each side of an octagon is, is equal to 0. 0.4142 times the diameter, okay? So, and that is some kind of trigonometry, the tangent of 22.5 degrees, I believe is, is where that comes from. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, round off 0.4142 to 0 0.4, that's it. And I've discovered, I've decided that the difference uh, between 0 0.40 and 0 0.4142 is roughly the width of your pencil line. So it's really, you can um, ignore that. So, you see that every side here is uh, of the octagon is 0.4, and they mark every uh, where where the octagon is tangent to the circle. That it, it is on the circle surface, so you don't want to go below that. So here's how you mark up your piece. Okay, so setting up your blank again, you measure the diameter, which is. Um, with the calipers and you transfer that diameter to the length. So that is your um, um, uh, full size of the circle. Then what I usually do is I, I calculate half of the diameter and I, and I find the midpoint. Okay, so that's right here. Okay. Then I measure uh, to get that 0.4 uh, times the diameter across the top, I have to measure 0.2 on each side of the midline. So that's 0.2 here, 0.2 here, okay? Then I want to get that same dimension here, 0.4, and I do that again with the caliper and I, and I reduce the diameter of the, uh, of the tenons to, meet, to match that 0.4. And you could do that using calipers to measure the diameter at 0.4, or you could, some guys I've seen on, on, on YouTube, they measure this dimension here, which is 0.3 times the diameter. And you can see 0.3 plus 0.4 plus 0.3 equals, D. So um, those are the measurements you need to make. You measure the diameter and you make these calculations. Then you start to cut. And here's the first cut. 
So again, you want to make an octagon where all sides are 0.4. So you're going to make the cut where these yellow lines are. You cut from this um, corner, you cut this corner off basically. And then you, you'll see now, if, you, if you're looking at that, this dimension is 0.4, this dimension is 0.4. So this one's got to be 0.4 and same here. You're cutting both of these, it's the same. You do this on both sides. Then you're, you're, you're again, almost home with only a few straight cuts. All right, so we're going to do that here. Put a piece of wood in, and this is, looks like it's another piece of sycamore. Using my spin or my skew to get a nice flat surface. not just flat or not just smooth, but flat. You want it, um, uh, the diameter constant everywhere for this method or most methods. Nice clean surface there. You can see the ray fleck of the sycamore showing there. If you get quarter sawn oak, like Mike Mahoney talked about, the, the ray fleck is excellent. And the best, second best wood for, uh, for that type of work is quarter sawn sycamore. You really hit it on a, if you get that at the bottom of your platter, man, it's really nice. So there's my calculations. I measured the diameter with 62 millimeters and I calculated half of that, 0.4 and 0.2. And I'm gonna transfer all those uh, measurements to the, to the wood. If I was going to make a very large sphere that I wanted to hollow and I didn't have a jig to get it close, I would use the octagon method. Because the templates I get, I think, get a little bit cumbersome, cumbersome at an eight inch diameter. But some guys do it. I've seen it on, a, uh, I've seen people do it, make a, you know, an eight inch diameter uh, template to use, or maybe a four or five inch ring gauge. All right, so this is the midpoint. Now I'm going plus or minus 0.2 times of the diameter. I think that was 24 millimeters on both sides. So now the, the, um, the next step is to get, get the calipers back at 0.4 times the diameter. Get it exactly right. Lock it in and re reduce both tenants down to that size. This is a Thompson parting tool. Still too big.
Now you'll notice here when I'm, uh, I don't do this that often. I, I tend to um, do the method of um, turning the lathe off and using the calipers to measure and then cutting it back and forth, iterating quite a bit. Um, this one here, you know, if you hold the gauge there as you cut, you should be able to get it exactly right much quicker. Um, notice that your hand is getting pretty close to the headstock. Your wrist is very close to the rotating machinery. That's why you don't wear long sleeve shirts or long sleeve smocks uh, when you're um, turning on a lathe. You, your arm can get quite close to where, you're, uh, where, where it could get jammed into, a, into the rotating chuck if you're, if you're unlucky. Probably another safety method mention I should, uh, I forgot to mention before, is every now and then you'll see my head in the field of view of the camera. You'll see I'm wearing a helmet with a visor and it's, uh, it's got a powered respirator on it. It's a fan that I have that, uh, a fan unit that uh, attaches to your hip and it, it sucks in um, fresh air through that fan. It goes through a filter and then it, it, the clean air is pumped up to the, my helmet and blows through the helmet to keep, keep dust away from my nose. Very important dust collection uh, for us old guys you don't want to fill your legs, uh, your lungs up with any type of dust if you can afford it. So it's much cheaper to buy uh, a good respirator than it is to uh, go into the hospital. There's going to be an article in the uh, next newsletter from Rich Gibbs. He experimented, he found a new uh, version of a dust mask. It's called, I think, I forgot the name of it now, Razor. Let me come back to that later. Here, you see I'm making a straight cut. I'm removing the corners. I'm going from the, the pencil line to the, um, to the tenon, exactly, keeping a perfect straight line there, okay, doing both sides. So by the time I'm done making this cut, um, I'll have an octagon. Making a straight cut, you can always judge if you're, if you're off, you know, the distance from the top horizontal surface to the vertical surface has to be equal as you're cutting more and more off. If you're, if you don't, if they're not equal, that means you're not at exactly the right angle. So you just adjust your angle on your next cut. Okay. So now I'm redrawing the, the, those octagon, the lines of the octagon, then I'm drawing the midpoints, okay? There and there, okay? Then I'm um, subdividing those midpoints again, just by eye, okay? Now I'm going to, I'm going to reduce the, uh, these tenons a little bit more, and then there's gonna be, there's a new corner now right here that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna cut that corner off again, making a straight line cut from this line to this line. And there's gonna be another corner here from, and you're gonna, I'm gonna make a straight line from here to here to remove that corner. So by removing these corners, I'm going from an octagon to a 16 sided figure or something like that. I don't even know what it's called, a dodecahedron, or I don't even know. Anyways, um, it'll be much, much closer to round. And then at that point, um, you could use several ways to get it perfect or as round as you want in order to get it um, uh, into the cup chucks. So I'm removing, I'm reducing the diameter just to create that corner. You could see the corner now here that's um, going to go from this line to here to remove this corner. So these two corners are going to be removed. And at this point, I, uh, you don't actually have to go to a straight line. You can make it slightly round, but I think going straight, removing the corners is, um, is the is best way not to make a mistake. 
Now there's still little tinier uh, corners still created and I'm rounding those off now. Straight line to remove the first corner. Final corner there. So now I have a 16 sided figure. Now I'm rounding off. So at this point it's pretty round, but you can get it even rounder. You can still see some facets there as opposed to being round. Um, use the ring, the ring gauge again to get it um, to get it even closer to, to round. And again, I'm emphasizing the the equator plus or minus 25%. So the middle half of the sphere. Um, should be as round as possible in order to, to minimize work when you switch to the cup checks. A little bit of freehand work, but it's already so round that you can't you can't lose it. So this you can see here that that cup chuck is getting close to being too big to use on this size sphere, but I do have a smaller one. Um, I might pull that out now. Oh, I use the hole saw again here to just do a little bit touching up. Better do not have that tool rest up in place in case you get a catch It'll smack it down, smack your hands down into the tool rest if you're not careful. All right, so that's pretty damn good from, from my point of view. And that'll go into the, uh, into the cup chucks then to remove the, the final little bits. All right, so now I'm going back. So in the process here, this, uh, this one here was done with, a, uh, with a, the, turn, the sphere jig, this one with the sphere jig, most of these others are a mixture. These smaller ones were done with uh, templates. This one was done with the whole saw. So you can see um, um, the type, uh, the, the range of the spheres that um, you, could, you could use or you could make. These were all wet sanded with walnut oil and they have not been buffed yet. All right, so that's it. Any questions? Question on the hole saw. Uh, yes. You 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 grind that flat with the with the disc sander, and then it, do you end it up with a, a flat surface or is it slightly beveled inside? It's flat. It, it it's flat. Okay. Yeah, but, and the only reason I didn't really want to. Um, Remove, you know, to remove the teeth, it's removing what, a, a, almost an eighth of an inch of the of the of the hole saw. That's a lot of steel. I would didn't want to remove uh, remove all that steel with my with my CBN wheels. So I um, I just got I used my disc sander to get rid of it. But okay. the disc sander is nice because it keeps thing. You can definitely uh, hold that to get a nice square edge. Square edge. Okay. Yeah. And then that's just glued to a handle. Is that? No, I, I, uh, there's a hole in the hole saw. I mean, there's some kind of a threaded uh, okay, so arbor. And I, and I took out the, the arbor and I put, and I put a lag bolt into the, uh, okay. into the wood, wooden handle using washers. And um, on one of them, I, um, I used uh, ep epoxy to, to screw it in. And that was a mistake because once the wood shifted a little bit, it got a little bit loose and I couldn't tighten it anymore because of the epoxy. So it's better just to uh, tighten, you know, use, a, use some type of a socket wrench to tighten it in there. And then if it loosens, you can retighten it. Tighten it up. Yeah. Right, thank you. Hank, when, when do you do your hollowing? Before you turn it around or while it's- Always still? after, always after. Yeah, I get it. I leave it. I, I make it round up to the, up to the point where I'm ready to remove the 
tenon and I don't remove the tenon. I keep it mounted in that chuck and then I, and then I hollow using um, my hollowing rigs. Usually I hollow to a relatively thick wall thickness, like a half inch or so. If the, if the uh, sphere is, is green wood, and I usually prefer to hollow green wood, it's much less uh, uh, taxing. Um, the, the sphere, all these spheres may, could, be, uh, could change in shape a little bit after their turn, because if they're not fully dry, they might crack or you know they might turn a little bit oval. And the same thing with the hollow form. Once it's dry, it might not be round again. So if the walls are thick enough, um, it allows you some uh, margin to re true it as a perfect sphere. Also, if you're not, um, if you're a little bit nervous about the bottom, removing the tenon um, without poking through the, the, the hollow form, you might leave the walls a little bit thick and then you're able to, uh, uh, by putting it, using the cup centers, you should be able to get rid of that, uh, the tenon then and, and, the, um, and get it perfectly round without putting it back on the hollowing rig. Um, the other thing is, or in some cases, I'll just turn that tenon into uh, the raw material needed to make small feet. And that looks good too. So how many years have you been doing the spheres and how many spheres in total have you made? Okay, um, I do them in batches. Like I, I probably made, um, maybe five or six years ago, I, I tried to make my first spheres, um, made a bunch of them, like 20 in a, in a month. And I got pretty good at it. And then I didn't do them for quite a while. And then I made another batch of 20 and I had to relearn you know, I mean, you, you don't forget everything, but you're not like fine tuned and you can't like pop them out. It, after the 10th or 11th sphere, you could do a complete sphere in 15, 20 minutes total from a uh, rough cylinder to 400 grit sanded uh, sphere in, in 15 to 20 minutes without, too, with, uh, after you're, uh, you've warmed, you know, got, got in a groove. <laughs> yeah, up till now. Now I, I usually do them just with the, um, with a hollowing more often than not. I used to, I, sometimes I sell them as a, as a group. I put like five or six different species of wood on a bowl and I try to sell that as one big thing. And they go, uh, every now and then someone buys one. And I, and I sell these for like between 25 and $50, even up to a hundred dollars for a um, individual sphere, depending on the size. If I put threads on it, like a baseball or a softball, that seems to help. a lot of people like those.